All right, everybody, I am back here with my special guest, Scott Mason, and we were talking about the Star Trek phenomenon. And speaking of the Star Trek phenomenon, I, I gotta ask you, what's the appeal? What is the appeal of the Star Trek phenomenon to you, personally? Well, you know, me, me and that same friend here talked about, uh, I talked about Star Wars with, you know, we, we both respect each thing. He, he's a big Star Wars fan, I'm a yeah. big Star Trek fan. Um, you know, he, he, he likes Star Trek, but he's not as into it as I am. And I like Star Wars, but I'm not as into it as him. Mm -hmm. So the, the big difference for me with, with Star Wars, it, it doesn't really seem like a possibility. Yeah. You know what I mean? It has, it has that in a galaxy far, far away thing going on <laughs> and all this other stuff. Whereas Star Wars is Earth, or Star Trek rather, is Earth-based. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, you know, not too far in the future. And, and that, that, that appeals to me a lot. Um, I love the storylines. I love the characters. I love the, the stuff. I still have all my toys, you know. Uh, um, it, it all started with me, though, with me and my dad and my and my brother and my mom, to be honest. We all, every Saturday night, it was the same thing. Uh, I'm, I was a next generation child, you know. Right. Um, so every Saturday night, it was the same thing. You know, my mom would come home from work with Zarky's Pizza. Uh, we would eat pizza. We would watch Star Trek. I would have a bath, and I would go to bed. That was the same thing every Saturday night. Wow. And, uh, you know, that's that's where it all started for me. And as, as time went by, I just got more and more into it. My dad's, like, he's the brainchild of it all. If I'm ever, like, in a situation where I can't answer a question that somebody's asking me, he's the guy I call. He's my lifeline, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I've had to call him a few times because I've almost been stumped. But, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of where it's at for me. You know, it's an, it's an entertaining show. It's, it's, you know, I'm not one of those guys who goes out and dresses up and, and gets that hardcore. And, you know, if I went to a convention, I wouldn't dress up as a Klingon. I don't know the Klingon language. <laughs> I don't do any of that stuff, you know, but it's, it's, it's an entertainment thing for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, has your dad seen the new Star Trek film? He hasn't yet. He's actually waiting for me. I've seen it once already. And he's, I think we're going together i'm not sure when but you know i'm he's he's in and he's he's anticipating it i'm not sure i'm not yeah he's he's an original series buff so he might have a little bit more criticism for it than i would right um because he just that was that was his series that was his that was his thing so I, i'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about it and uh you know having having little talks and debates with him about it probably <laughs> so yeah all right, very good. Uh, now that you actually almost led into what my next question was going to be, um, how you compare to other Trekkers or Trekkies, if you will. Some people, that's pretty much a street term, but I think they prefer Trekkers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <laughs> there's two terms. <laughs> wow, this is going to make me look nerdy. Um, <laughs> Trekkie is like, is like the hardcore guys. Those guys are like the... Uh, Go to conventions, dress up, and sleep with Spock ears on. You know what I mean? Like they're the they're the hardcore guys. Know the Klingon language, all that stuff. Whereas a Trekker is just kind of a follower. Like they enjoy the show, they enjoy the series. They, you know, they have a few little knickknacks and things like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, that that that's kind of the definition between those. And where I stand, I'm more of a Trekker. Yeah. You know, I, I really enjoy the series. I know a lot about it. It's something I've, I've invested, not really invested, but <laughs> kind of really enjoyed over the years. And, uh, you know, I have, like I said, I still have my toys and still have that <laughs> stuff. Um, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always looking for new things and, you know, it's, I'm always having conversations. People are always testing me on my knowledge. That is true. Yes. Everywhere I go lately, especially now that the movie, new movie came <laughs> out, you know, everyone's asking me trivia and all this kind of stuff. The best question I've had is actually um, was actually Sunday night. Someone uh, from my church asked me um, where this originated from, oh. and and the term "live long and prosper." And right. the answer is it started. Live Long and Prosper was first heard in the original series when Spock had to return to Vulcan to get married and when he kills Kirk. Okay, That's where it started from. This, on the other hand, was a Leonard Nimoy invention. Oh, okay. They gave him, they gave him control. the control over that. And it actually started because 
growing up, he was Jewish. Right. So he would go to the temples and stuff like that. And when, um, when the priests were blessing you, you actually had to turn away. You had to have your backs to them. So one time when he was a kid, you know, being mischievous, he turns around and he sees them going like this over top of them. And that's where he got that from. Oh, wow. So that, there's a, just a little... Uh, yeah, I had, no, I had no idea that actually that was that was that, his creation. That was all him. The thing I like about Leonard Nimoy the most, and I think that was hard for Zachary Quinto to really uh, duplicate, was his voice. Leonard Nimoy has one of the most distinctive voices in all of entertainment, in my opinion. He's narrated numerous documentaries and specials, and I think that uh, Quinto did the best job he possibly could, because, you know, you can't always duplicate a distinctive voice. I think that... Uh, it's, it's a tough task, but he still did the best of what he could. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you was um, there have been many Star Trek series, from the original to the next generation to Deep Space Nine and so on. Yeah. Um, how do you analyze each series? How, do you, how does it appeal? each series appeal to you? Um, the, the number one thing that I look for if they're going to make a new series is that it all ties together. Yes. You know what I mean? I, I, I dislike when things don't add up in the history of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all the, I'm pr I pretty much like all the series, except for um, the newest one, the Enterprise series. Yes, yes. I was, me and many people were not a big fan of that series, um, because it way predates Kirk. Yes. It, it predates the movie, everything. It predates it all. So, and that, that just made, think, and again, it was touch screen. It just looked way too advanced for the time that it should have been in. Uh, the Klingons, for example, they had the little ridges, which hadn't happened yet. Because I don't know if you know this, or, but um, Klingons didn't used to look like that. They used to look okay. more humanoid. They didn't have the ridges yes, and stuff yes. like that. But there was a disease that infected them, and that's where that came from. And it happened over time, and it happened more in at the end of the original series. Okay. Going into the next generation. Okay. And that's where the transition kind of happened. Right. So... <clears throat> But if you look in the Enterprise series, all of a sudden they show up and there's Klingons with ridges everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but as as a as a, as a series, I, I, that's the number one thing is I just I want everything to tie together. Right. I think they did a pretty good job between uh, the original series and the Next Generation. Um, also, I want them to create like a new storyline. You know what I mean? I'm glad when Deep Space Nine came around, I was glad that it wasn't just another ship flying around the galaxy. I right. was glad that it was kind of more stationary. Station. <laughs> you know, I was glad glad for that, and that it was focused on that one spot. And uh, then you get into Voyager, and, you know, it's a ship again, yes, but it's in totally new ground. It is, and yes. It's set to the other side of the galaxy. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. A, that's that's kind of what I look for in in, in a series as a. And it's, I just want it to be all historic, historically accurate. My <laughs> friends who were with me uh, at the movie on Sunday night, um, especially Ryan, he was sitting next to me. He would hear me when I was going like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, whenever something would come up. And by the way, I'm in love with the green chick. Just so you know. <laughs> oh, very good. Yes, yeah, she was she was very impressive. I will say that. You can say that. Well, for me personally, uh, the original Star Trek series was even, you know, you look back now, some people look, think of it as cheesy and with its effects. And it was actually probably pretty accurate for its time, I'd say, for the 60s special effects. Um, for the next generation, I was really impressed with the acting on that show. I think that had probably the most talented cast of actors led by the great Patrick Stewart, who I have great respect for as an actor. But both Voyager and Deep Space Nine, or Deep Space Nine and Voyager, if you want to go in order, really did well in terms of the setting. Like, I have to agree with that. Yeah. And, and all, pretty much most of the shows, with the exception of the Enterprise series, I was pretty impressed by I'm more of a casual fan myself, for those of you who are wondering. I'm not really uh, a Trekker or a Trekkie. I'm just more of a guy who will watch it if it's on kind of thing. All right, we'll be back with the final segment, and we're going to give our list of the three best and three not-so-best Star Trek films. We'll be right back. <laughs> 